Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Noah Hawley to our At Home with Literati series in support of his latest novel, Anthem. Just a quick webinar uh, overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, as you may have heard as you entered, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase uh, Anthem from our bookstore throughout the event. In fact, I'll put one in there right now for you if you've yet to pick up your copy. Um, live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well using the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also use the Q&A feature at any time to submit your questions for Noah this evening. So at any time when you have a question, please feel free to submit it. Uh, I'll get to as many of those questions as, as I can uh, towards the end of our conversation this evening. Uh, and finally, if you are watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books directly in the description below me. You can always also subscribe and like our videos to be kept up to date for all of our events when they become available uh, on our channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or Ann Arbor, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon, um, depending on when and where in the world uh, you may be joining us from. Without further, introduce, uh, without further ado, excuse me, I'll introduce tonight's author, award-winning author Noah Hawley. is one of the most accomplished auteurs and versatile storytellers working in television, film, and literature. Over the course of his more than 20-year career, Hawley's work as a novelist, screenwriter, series creator, showrunner, and director has garnered acclaim, winning an Emmy, Golden Globe, Penn Critics' Choice, and Peabody Award. As a best-selling author, Holly has published six novels, Conspiracy of Tall Men, Other People's Weddings, The Punch, The Good Father, Before the Fall, and now Anthem. Please join me in welcoming him into your uh, living room or kitchen or, or hopefully not car if you're driving, but car if you're a passenger. Uh, Noah, thanks for being here on, on At Home with Literati. Of course. It's my pleasure to join you from my home as, as I join everyone from my home. <laughs> Um, I thought maybe to get us started and, and acquainted for, for readers who have not yet to pick up Anthem, if you might read uh, just a sort of a small sample of it um, to what our appetites. Uh, yeah, there is in, in the book a, a running story about, um, I guess, w what one could call a pandemic of uh, adolescent suicide. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll, I'll read some of a, a chapter called Theories. There were no shortage of theories. Those who believed in original sin saw our children's suicides as a sign of secular corrosion. They blamed the war on Christmas, the separation of church and state. Gun control advocates saw our children's suicide as a form of PTSD. They called them the mass murder generation raised on active shooter drills. Hadn't they come of age after all to the headlines? 11 dead in Virginia's middle school, 13 gunned down at Denver High. Hadn't they awoken each morning to see gun control laws debated, but never passed, policies introduced, but never ratified. Change, they were told, was too difficult. And so gunfire echoed through their cafeterias. Our fear skyrocketed. And to combat that fear, we bought more guns. Thank you. Um, so you're reading from, from one of the opening chapters of the novel, um, and it's, it's very jarring. I mean, it starts with the first line is the summer our children begin to kill themselves was the hottest in history. So in your excerpt, you're already talking about, about sort of the epidemic of gun violence in this country and mass shootings, but uh, what it's alluded to is, is sort of ongoing climate catastrophe already happening in the background of this epidemic a uh, pandemic of, of suicide. And the thing that's fascinating to me is, is a novel that explores not sort of like a post-collapse society, but an active collapse society. We're used to like post-collapse narratives in our culture that sort of have some kind of like outsized virus or plague um, or some sort of biological mystery. And then we sort of fast forward through collapse to who's left behind. Here, it's a wave of, of voluntary action. Um, and we're at the crux of, especially now, an incredibly tense moment with adolescent mental health in this country if that wasn't already an issue. Um, and young people more than ever, I think maybe especially this month, feel like they are 
you know, so many bargaining chips in an adult world, um, using them to sort of fight battles about, about politics and public health. Um, but Anthem is also propulsive and thrilling and fun read. And so I, I, my first question is just, I'm wondering how you handle the weight of taking on as sort of like a world building element, but also as sort of central to the text, a topic that, that already borders on an endemic problem in this country um, in a way that takes it seriously as I think the novel successfully does, but also in a way that sort of accelerates it or, or plays it up in, in sort of a fantastical way uh, to, to, to propel the novel. Well, there was a moment in, in, in writing the book that I realized that the structure of the book should be uh, that of a, a fantasy novel, you know, Lord of the Rings or, or um, The Hobbit, um, Game of Thrones, something something like that. Um, and and those are always, uh, you know, a quest um, to fight evil to save the world. There's always that element in it, but but they're always make believe. You know, it's always some white-haired wizard um, somewhere. And, and I guess what occurred to me is that, you know, we, we reached this moment in America where there's, there's so much, let's call it magical thinking about, about the world um, and, and this, this sort of uh, polarization between facts and feelings, right? You, in, in the book is described as the kingdom of Main Street and the kingdom of Wall Street. The kingdom of Wall Street is, you know, sort of as it sounds, science-based, NPR listening, you know, people who believe that, that if they, if the other side just knew the facts, they, they would come around to our point of view. And, you know, on the other side, the kingdom of Main Street is more instinctual, emotional. They believe that their fact, their feelings are facts. And so you have this sort of war that's going on between these two sides. And, they, and the book is really an adventure novel of, about these, I mean, some of the characters are teens and about these teens who go on a quest to try to save the world. And as you said, like the, the, the apocalypse is easy, right? Because if it's the apocalypse, there's no doubt, right? That it's the apocalypse, but it's this pre-apocalypse, right? Where we, where we rational the people go, is it, is it, should I be hoarding food or is it just another crisis that will pass? Like there's so much doubt. And of course, doubt and fear is also known as anxiety and anxiety that we carry as adults, we pass on to our children. And so we have very anxious children. Um, and, and, and that sort of completes the circle of, of where the book began for me is, you know, if we're not going to solve the problems that create anxiety in our children, how, how are our children going to solve the problems that come from that anxiety? Right. I think that's what's so, you know, if apocalypse is easy, then what's hard is, you know, the, the thing that's afflicting humankind is not something that can be explained by like aliens or like a, a parasitic fungus or something it's that everything that's actually happening is hap is still happening unabated and is causing kind of almost rational suicide of the generation that's going to have to inherit it there's no sort of like problem that's why i mean it's interesting that that, that chapter you read from is called theories but it's like well you don't need <laughs> you don't need theories to explain the sort of emergent thing that's going on and i think that's what's interesting to, to think of this as a, a fantasy as well because it's a fantasy rooted in uh, a, a completely like it only takes one sort of logical step to kind of get there to sort of see that thing happening. Um, but to, to, to continue this trend a bit, I mean, you have a reputation, reputation for writing uh, beyond the cusp of, of current events um, or our understanding of the world we're all living in. Um, I think Fargo season two does a really fascinating job of this uh, in a way that blew my mind with framing this very small human drama and tragedy that's put playing out on the Minnesota Dakota border with, you know, the occasional presence of UFOs um, sort of like just gave me a perspectival shift that I still think about. Um, and you said that you, you've mentioned in other interviews, you set, you set out to write Anthem in 2018, thinking of what 
2022 would like. Obviously, in 2018, we had a lot of building blocks for what 2022 would look like already, some of which you mentioned in, in that excerpt, um, and they got more ominous with each day. I think for many of us, the past five years has sort of, it's felt like reality outpaced our ability to even properly depict it, uh, let alone satirize it or sort of extrapolate it. So in the process, the, 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 the drafting of this novel, without spoiling anything, um, you know, how did, how did the pace of reality contend with the writing of Anthem? Um, and were there things where you sort of just accepted that you might be prescient or could not include things? I mean, you ended up including COVID as well. Yeah. Well, the last year I was writing the book, we were, we were in this pandemic. So right. I, you know, I had to, I had to make some adjustments to catch up to what hadn't been going on when I started the book, but, but, um, you know, I had to make choices along the way. I, I knew that the book would be published after the election in 2020, and I had to make a choice as to, you know, who was going to win that election. Not not the specific person, but but Wall Street, Main Street, right? You know, and and had I chosen wrong, I feel like the many of the ideas in the book, which were kind of rooted around this idea that that. Um, you know, Trump had lost and, and everything had gone back to quote unquote normal, you know, the, the EPA was still, was talking about climate change again. And, you know, and, and magazine editors were assigning culture pieces and, you know, everyone felt like, Oh, thank, thank goodness that's over. But the idea of course was like, well, it's kind of like Obi-Wan, you know, you, yeah. you, you stri strike them down and, and they come back stronger. And, and certainly, you know, we, we've seen that in the, in the year since, the election is is the stuff that we thought was just going to fade away is not is not fading away um and then you know i mean I, I finished the book in 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 december um you know after the election and um you know but probably in october i wrote the section of the book in which there is, I mean, an insurrection for the lack right. of a better word, which was a few months before January 6th. You know, and on, on some level, it's, you know, it's not worst case scenario. It's just trying to think things through one or two steps. You know what I mean? What, what, yeah. hap what happens when, when you spend 30 years with Fox News terrifying people and then and then you tell them that their elections are being stolen and their country is being stolen. And, and, you know, the, the guy recently who said, when do we get to use the guns? I mean, it's that this is the natural progression of things is when you say that to people enough and they believe it, then, then, yeah, they feel like they're fighting for their lives and, and it stops becoming fantastical. And, and that, you know, that was the sort of the, the crux of the book is, you know, everything in the book, is made up and yet everything yeah. in the book has happened or, or could easily happen. And, you know, there's a moment in the book in which I, the author, you know, come back on, on the page and apologize because the book that I've written is so ridiculous, but what am I supposed to do if my job is to reflect the world as it exists around me? What, what do I do if the world seems ridiculous, not comic, but, right. but almost absurd. Um, you have to write a book that contains that absurdity. And then of course people read it and they, and they think that you're, that you're poking fun, but uh, it's not, I'm not poking fun. You know, it's just, um, you know, I mean, the QAnon shaman, is there anything else to say really like this? This was the revolutionary cosplay. Um, and, and, and the, 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 the joke of it is, is, is deliberate because, you know, the instinct is so ugly and, and the, the understanding is if we make it ridiculous, then people won't take us seriously to their own detriment. Yeah, yeah. And I want to return to the, the, what you bring up, which is a really compelling part of the book as well, is, is 
the sort of authorial intrusion into the text itself, which also happens at the very outset uh, in, in the author's note. Um, but I do want to talk more about, you know, you, you, you mentioned that this is where you thought of this as a fantasy novel, an adventure novel, uh, a fantasy novel, um, but, but rooted in the real world we live in. Um, and that sort of play with, I'm just curious about how that sort of play with genre um, influenced your writing or, or if that's something as well, that's, I think I know, or have seen throughout your, your work across mediums too, um, stories that are rooted in these very real frames, but are using these sort of outsized things and the way that, excuse me, I don't want to get too philosophical here. The, the fantasy or the genre thing can actually help reflect better some of these sort of central ideas or we start to see where things like fables come from and how they're not too dissimilar. I think that's really interesting in the case of Anthem because there are, there are like analogs for real world characters. Um, there is a sort of a, a Jeffrey Epstein and, and Ghislaine Maxwell duo here, but they're also known as the wizard and the troll. And they, they have these sort of fantasy names. There's, there's a central character is, is a, a young man who's just called the prophet who um, in, means that of himself in the biblical sense, right? Of, of, of being a voice, being channeling the message of God through like things like the hum that people think they hear making truths about. Um, and so uh, it's not that you're like making fantastical characters out of real world analogs, but that those outside figures of our fables and forms are things we live with every day. Um, and I think it's especially interesting when you're writing a book about adolescence and how we use and foist fables and mythology upon adolescence as sort of like preparatory material. Um, but I'm just wondering like what your thoughts were about, for lack of a better word, like genre form and what's instructive about archetypes um, to you. Uh, because you do something with them that seems to sort of like remind the reader that those things aren't as you know, we live among interesting myths and monstrous figures sort of always already. Yeah, we, we're going to, we're, we're mythologizing animals, you know, that that's part of how we, um, how we look at the world is, is, you know, our biblical stories have been replaced um, by Star Wars and Marvel and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, it's, there are characters in the book, you know, there's a character named Randall Flagg, who, of course, is a very famous character from, uh, you know, from the stand. And when confronted about his name, he says, it's a fictional world. Why can't I be a fictional character? <laughs> but then, you know, he, he lives up to the name. You know, he's this 20 year old survivor of the Parkland shooting and, and he becomes this sort of um avenging angel on some level who you know who seems larger than life he lives he lives up to the name and and there's there's something interesting in that for me with the reader which of course is you know there's two ways to go there's there's the way where you give him that name and you make him outsized and then you cut him down because of course everyone's just human in the end right or you say you know when we need him the most and he rises to that moment in, in a heroic way, you know, it's so satisfying because of course, you know, that that's, that's what those stories do, the fantasy novels do, you know. Um, but if you think also about, to go back to the kind of cosplay insurrection, yeah. right, which is, you can't, there's no, there's no fiction as the second draft, right? There's fiction built into the first draft of history, you know, and, and, and this idea that, that, you know, all of these young men are, they're, they're, they're reenacting Fight Club. They're, they're reenacting, um, you know, war movies they've seen and Mad Max and, and they're dressing that way and they're acting like, that way and and there's really no line between fact yeah. and fiction you know um and and that that was fascinating to me and in, in 
you know, in looking at this book, because of course, you know, if people who call themselves Boogaloo boys and put on Hawaiian shirts and, and carry AR-15s, you know, there's make-believe built into yeah. the very serious thing that they're doing. Um, and how are we supposed to navigate that? Yeah. You know, and how are our children supposed to navigate that? Yeah, that makes sense. It, it, it's just uh, interesting to think about, you know, f- fictional forms bleed into reality um, in that way. So it's not so strange to think of fantasy as sort of at this point, like no, no more or less impossible than, than reality. Um, well, you know, a man, a man believes that children are being held in the basement of a pizza restaurant and he goes in, he's armed because he's going to rescue those children. And as far as he knows, those children are literal children. They're real. Right. This, this thing is real. And think of that moment in which there is no basement. Right. There are no children. <laughs> and the, the sense of, of disconnection from reality that hits him, which is only made worse the next day, once arrested, when, when sort of right-wing media says, oh, he is a false flag operator. Like he is not a real person. He was sent there to, you know, it's like the level of conspiratorial thinking yeah. in which you can be a, a warrior for a cause you think is just one day. And the next day you find yourself, no one will talk to you because they believe you're part of the cover up. Yeah. You know, it's 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 mind bending. Yeah. And I, I, that's I think that's the kind of the effect. There is a mind bending effect to Anthem, I think, too, insofar as one is reading fantasy but it's made up of all of the 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 sort of like overawing trash and detritus of reality and all of its crises and everything else and so it's very it's stunning how very easy it is to make you know implausible mythology out of like i said at the beginning like it's not so not so hard to imagine a, tr- a real staggering pandemic of like generational suicide, given what, the condition in which <laughs> that generation is going to have to inherit and what they see about what we're doing about it. So I think that's interesting too, to, to, to just as a structure of a novel, how a- Anthem doesn't have to invent some, any sort of like deus ex machinas or anything to sort of uh, give propulsive heft or to comment upon the things that you're commenting upon. Um, and we, and we also see them ourselves living with, as you're talking about these sort of like imbricated <laughs> layers of fiction, uh, in yeah. our lives. Um, well, you mentioned, you mentioned Jeffrey Epstein, you know, you, you, you have this line between Pizzagate and, and the, the so-called children in the basement, and then this real world predator who, who, who right. preyed on children for decades. And it's, it's messy because you, you want there to be, to just be, this is a fantasy. There are, there's nobody out there who is abusing children. And yet then there is this very prominent guy who is abusing children. And, and it doesn't validate the conspiracy theory. It just makes it noisy. It's very noisy right. and, and it makes it very hard to say categorically that that this is not a, a problem in our society on the level that you think it is. And so, you know, the book, I think, by having those elements in it, I mean, acknowledges the noise. I mean, uh, I would imagine, you know, I go out of my way never to use the word Democrat or Republican yeah. in the book. I, I don't I don't. And I say very much at one point. You know, I apologize if it seems like I'm being political. It's not my goal to be political. Acknowledging that politics used to mean sort of civic discourse, but now it just means choosing a side. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, as the author, have no desire to choose a side. I just want the words that I'm using to mean what they used to mean, you know, <laughs> and to be able to have this conversation in which, you know, you... When I, if I have a conversation with you and I talk about freedom, right? Depending on who you are, that word means very different things now to people. Um, and so 
that is also complicated to try to just have a conversation with people and realize that the words they're using and the words you're using mean different things. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a quote here, uh, in my really messy document. Oh yeah. So bringing this back to, to centering this novel on children, this is the world <laughs> in which they're contending with, right? I mean, you and I can talk about separating uh, is Wayfair selling children on its website by naming their cabinets children's names from the fact that there appears to be a high profile pedophile ring that used private jets and, and implicates people very instrumental in the structure of our society and economy and, and try to sort of have those things be, um, you know, separated in our heads. Um, but there's a quote here uh, in the book, what, what skills must our children master to survive in a world where reality itself is polarized? Um, this is again from theories about what is, what is making children sort of the kind of setting of this novel is, there is a pandemic of, of suicide among among young people to the point that they're being sheltered. Uh, the the principal characters in this novel are placed in a in a sort of like anxiety center for the children of the wealthy uh, to sort of you know keep them safe. They break out of that to go on this mission uh, with the prophet to sort of uh, have some sort of uh, orienting mission to kind of perhaps save humanity, if not a few people's lives. Um, and I'm curious, you know, it's one thing to write a novel about all of these issues, obviously, and there, there, there are, we're seeing a sort of a rash of, of, of media, film, television, novels, you know, sort of imagine collapse and the stakes of collapse and life after collapse and that kind of thing. Um, but focusing on the, the young people is, is really fascinating to me. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, you are a father of, uh, I believe, a 14-year-old and a nine-year-old, if that's correct? Yeah. Um, and was it always sort of like, was it an idea of, of, of writing a novel about young people contending with this kind of chaotic reality or polarized reality? Was that first or was it addressing a, a chaotic reality the, the biggest impact you saw that created that chaotic reality was children, uh, which I guess is yeah. asking like, how did, how did parenthood, you know, affects the composition of Genesis um, writing of this novel? You know, I find myself in the last 14 years, you know, focusing more and more on, on the issues of, of parenting and, and, and childhood. And, you know, from the last season of, Fargo, which in which two two crime lords traded their youngest sons in order to keep the peace, you could really tell if a character was moral or immoral based on their relationship to it to a child in this in the story. And and you know, here certainly my worries and my concerns for my children, you know, factor into the book and, and the origins of, of the book. You know, it's not a struggle that you uh, and I had to worry about when we were kids, the, the polarization the, of reality, the fact that you know, there's some 20 to 30 million Americans who literally think that the president is illegitimate and that there's another president who's actually president. And, you know, that those things weren't true until, until now. You know, you talk to people who live in, you know, Russia or, or Pakistan or, or, or countries that in which they know that what the government tells them is not true. You know, that there's both yeah. an official truth and, and a real truth. That, that's not a, a factor of society that Americans have had to deal with. And so we don't know how to, how to adapt to it. It's very disconcerting. Um, and um, you know, there is in, in, in the third season of, of Fargo, you know, I played around a lot with this idea of truth, you know, the, the deconstructing the sentence, this is a true story. And, right. and you know, Carrie Coon at, at one point talks about, you know, that there's a real violence, a kind of mental violence to realizing that the world is not what you thought it was. Like, it's very damaging to our psyches to sort of 
you know, feel like the world, we've lost control of the world. You know what I mean? And, and, but our children don't know what the world is supposed to be, right? All they know is what the, what the world is. They don't know what it was like when I was a kid. They're just dealing with the reality that they have in front of them. And I, you know, I know how to teach them how to change a tire or, or, you know, um, have a, have a bank account, but, but how do I teach them? Okay. Well, well, some people are going to say this about the world and other people are going to say this about the world. Now we believe this, right. But these people really believe this. And how do you, what do you say if you find yourself in a gathering in which, you know, people have, um, different thoughts and they're aggressive about their beliefs versus your beliefs, et cetera. And, and of course, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's really, we're, we're, we're trying to figure it out as we're living through it, which is always complicated. Yeah. I, I was thinking that's fascinating to talk about this because before we went live, but, you know, reflecting on reading this novel and, and thinking about, um, what the children in this in the novel are contending with versus what children in the real world are contending with now or what they're what what they see um which i don't want to spoil too much of the book but is is almost directly addressed for you personally um towards the end and it made me think about my own struggles with anxiety as a very very young person where like you know, I'd like watch Discovery Channel and get have like a panic attack when like the you know Discovery Channel would note that like we can catch all meteors, but there there might be one that slips through and destroys us all. Yeah. You know, those kinds of like completely uh, almost fantastical disaster scenarios. And I also grew up in Iowa with like tornadoes and those sort of like emergent things terrified me. Um, and now I'm in my 30s and I'm I, you know, I can open my phone and watch like a, a fire tornado engulf at suburban Colorado um, or or any number of you know, incredibly scary environmental disasters. I didn't live through active shooter drills. Um, I, I, I wasn't being held out or forced to go into a school without protection from a novel respiratory virus. Um, and I, I think that's why what's so successful about, about the novel to me, or just sort of the idea of the novel is, is not thinking about these things because we're, we're forced to think about them all the time, uh, or else sort of like drown ourselves in, in sort of like creature comforts and, and the consumer economy to avoid thinking about it. But children are incredibly keen and perceptive of these things and watch us both contend and fail to contend with it. Um, and, and, and that's a, a, a lens through which to examine these ideas about truth, I think, in, in a way that is sort of like cuts through the bullshit for us as adults, I suppose. Um, um, so I guess that's more of a comment than a question, but. Well, but. yeah, I mean, so much of the world is, is, you know, adults telling children that things are complicated, right? right? Gun violence is complicated, climate change is complicated, and then but of course, children know the truth, which, right. which is that things are actually very simple. You know, either the planet heats up three degrees or it doesn't. It's not complicated. You know, I, either we pass gun res restrictions, you know, sensible gun laws or, or we don't. Um, and, and this idea that things are complicated is, is, is actually, um, you know, a, a very well researched and marketed campaign, yeah. you know, starting way back with, you know, smoking will kill you, but we want to sell cigarettes. So how do we create a reality in which you not only question the science, you question science itself. And, you know, it's not whether a thing are right is right or wrong. It's whether the thing is right or wrong for me. And nobody gets to tell me what's right or wrong for me, you know, which is on, on some level, a very heroic idea, but but manifested the way that it has been is a very cynical exploitation of people's desire to have, you know, autonomy and independence and, and, you know, and, 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 and on some level, you know, very much built into the DNA of this book for me is, is, you know, my reading of Kurt Vonnegut when I was a young man and, and the way that he would in Slaughterhouse Five or, or, or Breakfast of Champions or Cat's Cradle you know, he would take very, you know, things that people thought were complicated moral issues like war 
and reduce them to, to right. a child, a childlike simplicity, which is, yeah, we send our children to fight our wars. It's not, these, these are not wars fought by men, they're wars fought by children. And when you look at them in that way, the true horror of them really comes out, you know, and here was a guy who was a, you know, who wrote very serio comic novels you know, in which he drew cartoons and, and he, the author himself spoke to the reader and, um, you know, and I thought, oh, well, so how can I take this book that is filled with serious, very serious subjects and turn it into something people want to read, yeah. A, and B, that, that, you know, that plays to my sense of playfulness um, but also is, you know, in which I, the author, I'm not hiding behind the story in which yeah. I will say to you, look, I'm, I'm worried about my kids and I know you're worried about your kids. And, and rather than, than, you know, have some nonfiction conversation with you, I'm going to try to explain my worries to you in, 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 in a fictional form yeah. in a story, because of course, stories create empathy and, and, you know, and you see the world you know, through a character's eyes. Um, and I'm not saying that, that the story will change you or your mind, but for a moment in reading it, you might go, oh, I see it. I didn't think of it that way, but now I see it that way. Yeah. And I, well, it's, I mean, it's also the, the, the prophet, like I was thinking, hearing you speak, it reminded me of the scene of, of when we first meet the prophet in the float abatement anxiety center. And, and, um, it's hilarious and also really tragic because one of the things he talks about is, you know, sort of distilling really straightforwardly the attention economy and how his generation have become sort of economic units and their attention is bought and sold. And then this human beings are sort of like basically just their thumbs. And like you say, like it's this ability to sort of really simplify things. Um, they're not, you know, naive to what's going on. Um, and, but I picking up on, on, on another thread in your response here about, about inserting yourself into the text, you do so at the author's note, you mentioned that happens in, in the middle of the text that happens again as well. Um, you're, you have these multiple perspectives in your, your own perspective. Um, but I think this also goes back to sort of some of the metafictional or metatextual stuff that's happening. Like you mentioned with Fargo, where each episode begins with this is a true story um and we're that's never editorialized the 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 viewers sort of constantly sort of figuring out for themselves what they think that means obviously legion is playing with a lot of a lot of things and and explore the, the the fractured mind of its protagonist um I'm, so it's something that kind of runs through a lot of your work and i'm wondering what you think about been thinking about a lot about metatextuality recently, simply because it seems like it's a, a, a certain a, a way, one of the few ways we can really get at our arms around everything that's sort of happening. Uh, I thought the new Matrix movie weirdly did a, a good job of this, and and Lana Wachowski sort of trying to just be like, "Look, I'm actually here directing this movie, and and I'm going to speak through these characters in a way." Um, and so I'm I'm just curious what you know. Kurt Vonnegut seems like an obvious, you know, uh, a predecessor to this form, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if it's always been something you've been interested in, in doing, playing with perspective, playing with that for, sort of fourth wall breaking, and whether or not you think it has sort of added urgency in addressing um, audiences specifically, let alone addressing um, some of the topics you want to get at in your work. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I think the first novel that I read as a young man that really um, showed me that a novel could be more than just a story was, was white noise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in which Don DeLillo, you know, he, he, it, it is also a very sprawling story about a professor of Hitler studies and, and an airborne toxic ev event and, and, you know, the fear of death and a pill to try to counter the fear of death. But, you know, there's a moment in it in which his friend Murray takes him to the most photographed barn in America, you know, and he sees all these pictures taking, all these people are taking pictures of this barn and he realizes that what they're really photographing is 
is photography itself, that it's, <laughs> it's the most photographed barn in America. So they're photographing the most photographed <laughs> barn in America. There's something very meta about that. And, and, you know, it's not something that the settlers on the prairie ever had to, to think about, um, you know, and his daughter very famously is talking in her sleep. And when he re- leans in close, what she's saying is Toyota Celica, you know, there's something <laughs> about the, you know, and that, and that book in 1984 was, was very on the cutting edge of, of what right. consumerism is doing to, to us. Um, and, but, you know, on some level, this, you know, these conversations, if you, you go back to Kafka, you, you know, the, the absurdity um, of a totalitarian state, you know, a man who's on trial for, for what they won't tell him, right, you know, which would be funny if it wasn't so horrifying, um, you know, that line between comedy and tragedy has always been very interesting to me. Um, and, and in that, in that line, there is a thousand miles of, of, um, gray, you know, to, to be explored. You mentioned season two of Fargo where we had a UFO, you know, the idea was it was 1979, you know, after Watergate, the conspiracy went all the way to the top. You know, there was a lot of watch the sky stuff. Uh, Star Wars and Close Encounters had come out the year before. Like it was everyone was so on edge and paranoid. Right. It felt like, well, it felt like they could will the UFO into the story. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is in the book, you know, the 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 prophet is talking about how something like 33 percent of Americans believe that angels and demons walk among us and. And another character asks him, well, what do you think? And he says, well, I think the more that people believe in it, the realer it becomes. And even though we know that's not how things work, you know, there's a certain logic to it that the book takes on, which is, yes, the more magical thinking that exists in this country, the more magical this country becomes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and, and so, you know, these the people are online searching for for ghost sightings and you know it just feels like that line between reality and fiction is breaking down in parallel to people's you know the explosion of magical thinking which led me to you know Gabriel Garcia Marquez and revisiting 100 years of solitude and and you know the 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 magic realism of that book and the realization that you know, it's it's through magical realism that he made that ugly tragedy beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that there's a way in introducing magic realism into you know a very brutal or or horrific world that creates this 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 amazing quality to it that is that is somehow beautiful while still being awful. Yeah, I mean, the, the moment the the UFO arrives. Um, and in season two of Fargo for the first time is, is right after this uh, completely avoidable, terrible, like quintuple homicide or whatever. Um, and then it's just this stunningly transcendent, beautiful moment uh, as well. So it does provide that, that kind of eerie <laughs> beauty too, in a way that sort of captures the kind of, uh, you know, very Cohen <laughs> tragedy yeah. that is unfurling. And so I wonder, I mean, this, does the, does inserting yourself into the text, I mean, you kind of touched on that before, right? You want to comment upon the absurdity and stuff like that, but that move that sort of breaking of the fourth wall, um, you know, is it, the, the sort of that, that kind of metatextuality. I, I mean, I can say from my end as a reader is, is it does provide this kind of like, dizzying kind of levity as well and and its own kind of beauty um but it also seems to me to be like the only way to and this is why sorry to do this but to tie it to the the matrix in this strange way but like i didn't feel like that movie could exist without commenting upon itself and inserting its director into it as a means of sort of like you know the only way i can get out the cultural ideas that have been 
issued forth from the original movies is to comment upon them. And it seems like in Anthem, the only way for the fictional fantastical elements um, of it to sort of land in a specific way or for you to sort of invade upon them and, and to appear as the author. Um, well, the last thing I ever want to be is just clever, you know? Right, 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 right. And, and um, I can be clever, but, I, but it's not meaningful to be clever. And, 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 I, and I think, you know, and this was not a conscious, you know, I didn't, I didn't write a, a college paper on how to write this book before I wrote the book. <laughs> it, there was a, a sort of instinctual process to it. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, a, a big part of what gives the book meaning is the fact that the story is clearly my way of struggling with the world that I'm living in, yeah. right? And I'm trying to work it out um, on paper. You know, I've created these, the, you know, these characters, adults and kids who are on this journey together. And the stuff is that they're going through and is happening to them is horrible and, and, and absurd. And, and I wish that it wasn't happening to them, but I'm looking around at the world that I'm in and, and these horrible and absurd things are happening to other people's children. And, yeah. and, and, and so how is it, how is it absurd to put them in the book? Do you know what I mean? But yeah. I also know that if I'm not in the book saying that out loud, right, which is like, I didn't set out for these things to happen to these children, but this is what's happening to people. Yeah. Then a reader or a critic could look at it and go, you know, oh, he's written a farce about America because he thinks it's so ridiculous. And it's like, I don't think it's funny at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm not trying to be clever. I'm not apologizing um, for you know, as, as a way to cover up that I couldn't come up with a better book. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I, I'm apologizing that that this is the world that I'm in and this is the book that I have to write that to mirror the world that, that I'm in is, is um, you know, this is, I'm holding up a mirror in this book. And, and if you're looking at it and seeing something that looks like a farce to you, I'm not sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, I think in, in to, to buttress your, I don't think it's done cleverly. And as well, I think that one thing we forget about metafiction or, or authors who appear in fictional works or comment upon the work itself is that it's not entirely a, a postmodern thing. You can go back to to Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, to, to other texts that, that do the same thing. Um, and it often provides this kind of like, historicity to it truly um th that that is useful to 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 readers centuries later um and so yeah to me uh, that's all i meant to say to me is as a reader it came across as like emergently necessary to to have that happen um and but it seems to be of a piece with with your other works that um, feel where it seems like there's there's there are necessary moments where the story has to extend beyond its sort of like tidy story limits in order to to do certain things, and I've just always appreciated that in the work, I suppose. Yeah, I'm 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 fascinated by the boundaries of the mediums. Mm -hmm. You know what 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 can you do? Not just in the story, but with mm -hmm. a story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if someone asks me to make a television show about the future, I think, well, what's a television show going to be like in the future? Let's make that show. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just, okay, it's, it's, it's 20th century storytelling about the, about the 22nd century. It's like, well, let's do 22nd century yeah. storytelling. And, and, you know, Legion is, is the, the sort of wildest example of, right. of really pushing the medium to, so that the audience is saying not just I can't believe the character just did that, but I can't believe the show just did that, you know, and 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 so whenever I start something, 
I always think, A, what is the story? And B, how does it want to be told? And and I try to always think, well, what am I taking for granted? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I made this movie, Lucy in the Sky, which was a sort of magic realism astronaut movie. And and I thought, well, it's going to be in a movie theater. And, and what I'm taking for granted is the theater itself. It's mm-hmm. a giant rectangle surrounded by speakers. And the, and the assumption is you want to use the whole rectangle and you want to use all the speakers. But what if the theater itself was a tool, you know, and when she's up in space and everything's big, the whole screen is full and the, mm-hmm. and the sound is full. But when she comes to earth and everything seems small, the picture gets smaller and the sound goes to the front. And, and that's, that's always the challenge for, for me is, is again, not to be clever, but really like to the, use what the is space the yeah. way to tell the story. And it's rarely is it to start at the beginning, go to the middle and end in the end. Um, I want to move on to some of our audience questions because we have a couple, but thank you um, uh, for answering my questions, which are always a bit unwieldy, I recognize. No, you did good. Um, so we have a question from, from Matt who writes, what I love about your writing is that it's so character driven and that the stories tend to come out of the characters. In terms of where you start, does it generally start with a character and then you figure out a world in which they can inhabit? Or do you start from the outside in, so to speak, developing the world and later populating it with fascinating characters? I mean, usually it starts with a question for me on, on some level. Um, and it's, you know, it's different with different things. But, you know, the clearest example I can give is, is sort of my first book. You know, I had studied in college, um, you know, the history of, of conspiracy theories in America and paranoia in America. American thinking, and I graduated from college, and and it was the, you know, the time of the X Files, you know, and the truth is out there, and Timothy McVeigh, and and Ruby Ridge, and and it was yeah. clear that that cycle of paranoia was coming around again, and I thought, well, what what are Americans so afraid of? I thought, well, <laughs> I want to explore that, but what's a story? How would I explore that in in a story? And so I thought about. Um, you know, I thought about white noise and Delillo's yeah. professor of Hitler studies. And I thought, oh, well, what if it's a professor of conspiracy theories, you know, and his wife is killed in a plane crash and he realizes she was running away with another man and there is a conspiracy there. Um, and so I figured out a story that would allow me to answer the question, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and at some level, you know, it's, it's always thematic for me and, and, you know, um, you know, Fargo is, is a perfect example of, of that. You know, there's, there's, you know, I have a, you know, I employ a researcher, you know, who is always, I'm always sending him questions. I have, you know, I mean, for this book, I probably have a thousand pages of, you know, of, of you know, things that I've read and taken notes on and, and, you know, what, what he sent me and everything. So, but if I do my job right, certainly on the screen, it's filled with ideas, but you're not noticing necessarily yeah. because the, the, the idea is how do, you, how do you turn an idea into a story? You know, how do, you, how do you manifest it in such a way where the idea is clear, but it's not exposition um, because there, there is nothing, nothing worse than, than, than trying to sound smart through characters. Yeah. Um... I was going to ask, how do you handle <laughs> research? I mean, it's always a question I'm curious to ask about, about of authors who, who, uh, especially in Anthem, there's just, there's a lot of fascinating information, again, handled not in the sort of, it's, it's all what needs to be there. But as a writer myself, I often feel like the research becomes more exciting and endless than the composition. It seems like the you, you found the answer to that, which is the have a source that you can ask questions of instead yeah. of, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, <clears throat> a bookstore or a library is, is this, you know, it, it's this perfect expanse of potential you know, for, for ideas and, and, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing better for me at the start of my writing day than, than to read something that, that is, has a fascinating thought, Yeah. In, you know, and then the moment that, that, that you think, oh, that's interesting. And your brain starts going, then you just slip into gear of, yeah. well, not, 
necessarily what am I going to do with that idea, but no, now my brain's going and that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. And, you know, it just takes your, takes your mind um, places. But, but at the end of the day, if it's not grounded in a, in the emotional reality of people, then, then, you know, you're going to, you're going to lose an audience. Um, another question here that's uh, maybe a bit of a deep cut for you. I discovered your work around the, the time of the unusual, that the unusuals premiered, which I believe is also when the punch was released as a huge fan of both projects. Can you talk about what initially inspired you to write the punch? And if you're comfortable sharing where the unusuals might have gone, if it had been renewed for a second <laughs> season. Two very different questions. Um you know, the, the punch on some level was a way of, you know, processing a death um, in my, you know, my, of my father's death and, and, um, you know, thinking about these, these two brothers and, and, you know, the journey that they, that they went on together um, to try to bury, you know, or, or, or scatter their dad's ashes, um, you know, on, on, on some level trying to fend off their crazy mother while they, while they did it. Um, you know, and again, it's a, you know, it's, it's fiction as, um, a way to process the, the real world, not necessarily, you know, therapeutically, but, but, um, you know, the challenges, you know, that, that, that young men face in, in becoming, in replacing their fathers and becoming adults, you know. Um, you know, the unusuals, which was a, you know, a sort of comedic um, police show um, with Jeremy Renner uh, that we made 10, 10 hours of, um, you know, I, I had plans for where it would go. It's hard for me to remember what those, what those were. It, it was, it was a pilot that that ABC picked up as a kind of gimme, you know, that it was the last thing they picked up like, well, I'm, this might this probably won't work, but maybe it'll work. And, you know, I, I was really thrilled that I got to to put the time into it because, you know, it 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 it's a good example of of my later work, which is it's, you know, it's what they call execution dependent. You, you know, there's a tone of voice there that I, you know, I fine tuned over the years. And of course, once I left ABC, I could actually make things that yeah. were seriously dramatic or disturbing in ways and also comedic. But, um, you know, it was a great, it was a gr great to make, uh, you know, I had this idea, which is, you know, as a New Yorker, it's like the cops knock on any door, you know, there's a story behind it, you know, and, and um, you know, cer certainly I saw on like Brooklyn, nine nine like oh I, I they they I think they were they were picking up what I was laying down you know there there's that idea there um that um um you know it would have been a fun show to make and and you know the day after they canceled it uh Jeremy Renner was nominated for an Oscar for Hurt Locker <laughs> I would have called them and said you guys are idiots but what what would have been the good to that well, I mean, it's not like you did anything <laughs> after that. I know, he, he, he faded from view. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. I, I, I'm i going to have to leave my personal uh, uh, alien questions for another time, which is probably best for everybody. But uh, talking about using all of the, the story space available to you, um, uh, Susan writes, given your thinking about the blurring of fact and fiction, what do you think about VR? How far are we from obliterating that line? There's a lot of uh, augmented reality and <laughs> metaverse Walmart shopping stuff coursing through the doom scrolling these days. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't tried it myself yet. I mean, aside from early, you know, 10 years ago, putting on some goggles that didn't really work very well. Um, I worry about it for my son who's nine, you know, obviously all, any new technology is adopted fastest and easiest by children. You know what I mean? And, and um, so I'm not necessarily worried about it for adults because we, we have 20, 30, 40, 50 years grounded in reality. Um, but, you know, for kids who are still trying to figure out what's real and what's not real, 
you know, there's something to that. I mean, I was having a conversation with my wife the other morning about, you know, how do you solve the movie theater dilemma, right? And obviously, yeah. you know, in virtual reality, you can, you know, you can put on your helmet and go to a movie theater and sit with people or, you know, so, so some and feel a communal experience that isn't real, you yeah. know. Um, but, you know, I guess, I guess my, my fear is what we've, what we've seen from, from the beta version of alternate reality, which is the internet, you know, <laughs> which was designed, you, you know, with the idea that it would bring us closer together. And in fact, the opposite has happened because when we can't sh physically share space with people, we turn into assholes for some reason. Um, I don't think it's going to help on that level, you know, yeah. and there is still so much. I mean, my, my son has just started to explore, you know, video games and, and the instinct to hit someone and run away <laughs> because it's consequence free on some level, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of fascinating to watch, you know, games are, there's so much about gaming that is a, is this kind of violent fantasy delivery device and, and they, they take to it, especially the boys, they, they, you know, they get off on the fact that they can, you know, attack people and, and, you know, and so I don't know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily see the real world benefit to it. How is it going to improve the world uh, versus the entertainment aspects of it, right? How is it going to distract me from my life? You know, but I don't know. I mean, you know, we, we can now in the, in the movie business, we can design virtual sets and walk through them. And that's helpful. Like mm. there, there, there are tool uses of it, but, but as a consumer product, uh, I'm not sure that that's the answer to the problems that are facing us. And as a narrative medium, you're not interested in exploring games or, I don't know. I, mean, I, say I, VR, I don't know what the narrative medium of VR would be, but video games seem to be now a place where almost quote unquote prestige storytelling is now happening too. Yeah. It's hard to say. I mean, I know from having played games that, that the, you know, there is the gameplay itself and then there is the sort of filmed interludes between the gameplay and those can be as prestige as you want, but really most people just want to try to hit a and it goes away <laughs> and they can play the yes, game some sure. more, you know? So, <laughs> so I don't know. I haven't turned my head to what, what I could do with a game, but you know, maybe I will. All right. Well, uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but no, Holly, thank you so much for joining us tonight at Home with Literati. Um, viewers, please pick up Anthem at our bookstore. You can do so online. There's links in the chat. There's a link in the description below. If you live in Ann Arbor, pop on in and pick one up. Uh, no, I hope we can have you in the store uh, for the next one and the not too distant future. Um, but until then, uh, continue to be well. We look forward uh, to, to your next works. Uh, and to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you at the next event. Take care all. Thanks.